I have a pop quiz. Fifteen seventeen. Why is that date important to Unitarian Universalists? The start of the Reformation Gold Star Lutheran Sunday School right here. 1517, what's the name of the guy? Martin Luther. Luther. He was a monk. He was a Catholic monk, and he just had some ideas about how to make the Catholic Church a a little different. One of the things that he didn't like was the selling of indulgences, of passes to heaven. So um, the Catholic Church was going around saying, well, you know, Grandma's still in purgatory, but if you gave a little more, we could maybe... So uh, Martin Luther didn't like that idea and uh, 99 other things. So he wrote them on a piece of paper, and he nailed them to the door of the local Catholic Church just so that they were sure that everyone would be able to uh, read his work. He just wanted to reform some things. Um, and, but he was seen more like protesting. So he got to be known as a protestant, Protestant. See how that happened? Were we there? Okay. So the Protestants are established, Catholic Church, and now there are Protestants. So can I have someone be here? And uh, I need a little living timeline. Richard's always up for that, I know. I'm going to need a few other people, too. Just hold it up. Thank you. (laughs) Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, So there were other folks who, um, uh, who joined the Protestant movement, like John Calvin, and he believed that everyone was predestined when you were born to either go to heaven or hell, and he established his own community in Geneva, Switzerland. Meanwhile, and I'm going to need someone else, so, you know, just come on up. Thank you. And his name's on the other side. Uh, There was a physician named Michael Servetus, and he wrote a book in 1531 called On the Errors of the Trinity, for which he was persecuted by, among others, John Calvin. So Michael Servetus was actually burned at the stake by Calvin, with a copy of his latest book, that one was called The Restoration of Christianity, which Servetus had sent to Calvin. So Calvin had that strapped to his leg. In that book, in The Restoration of Christianity, he denounced the divinity of Jesus and infant baptism. And Michael Servetus inspired many followers, and one of them Come up. I need the next person. Who's coming? Thank you. One of them, and you have two names, so you'll just have to get fancy with that when the time comes. One of, the, one of uh, Michael Servetus' followers was Giorgio Biandrata. He was an Italian physician, and he um, moved to Geneva, and he became a chief advocate for Michael Servetus' ideas. And he refused to sign John Calvin's Orthodox Confession, and he fled to Poland, where he became the personal physician of a young Princess Isabella. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And Princess Isabella eventually grew up. She married a Transylvanian king, and she became Queen Isabella, and she had a baby. And... oh. We're a little out of order here. Um, And uh, King John Sigismund, he became king when he was only a couple weeks old. But his mother raised him as an anti-Trinitarian. And so then once he was an adult, he became the first and only Unitarian king in history. So I need someone over here with John King King John Sigismund, please. Thank you. Yep, you can both come up because you're, I'm going to need, I'm going to need both of you. I don't, you can figure out how to open that one. There'll be another one. Come on up. So in, 19, 
1968, uh, 1968, 1568, thank you for that, that's why we need the living timeline, uh, um, King John Sigismund put out uh, to have a, a debate, a religious debate, um, and this was in the town of Torda in Transylvania. And his, the chief advocate for his ideas was uh, Francis David. And in the Edict of Torda, the declaration after this religious debate, it guaranteed religious freedoms to Catholics, Lutherans, Calvinists, and Unitarians. It was the most far-reaching relig religious toleration law in European history, and it remains to this day the most far-reaching religious toleration law, proclaiming that faith was a gift from God and that no one should suffer at the hands of others for religious reasons. I will note that it, this religious toleration was not extended to Orthodox Christians, Jewish people, or Muslims. And we know that this is still a struggle today. When King John Sigismund died at age 30 in a horse accident, the new rulers did not share his religious tolerance. And Francis David was sentenced to life in prison for his belief, and he became a martyr for the Unitarian cause. There's now a memorial to him in the prison cell where he died in Deva, Transylvania. Transylvania is the mountainous region bet between modern-day Hungary and Romania, but that land was Hungarian for at least a thousand years and then was given to Romania at the end of World War I. So the Unitarians in Transylvania are ethnically Hungarian, and they find themselves then in Romania, foreigners in their own land. After World War II, Romania was occupied by the Soviet army and they were forced to adopt Soviet communism. So until 1991, the Unitarian church lands and buildings and schools were taken by the government for communal rule. And many Unitarian churches in Transylvania today are still negotiating with the government to get all of their property back. Through all of this, they have kept that spirit alive. They've kept their Hungarian culture and language going. And today, there are 150 Unitarian congregations in Transylvania and about 50,000 people who are part of those communities. The Unitarian Church has, in Transylvania has a bishop and a catechism, a set of defined beliefs with over 100 points that young people are expected to learn. One of those points, they ask, how do we understand God? We perceive God as soul and love. God is spirit, and they that worship God must worship in spirit and in truth. The Unitarians in Transylvania have worshipped together all of these years and never given up their identity. The strength and love they have for each other is demonstrated to all of us in their commitment to uh, soul and love and spirit and God. So let's get back to our timeline for a second. I need another person. I'm going to need two more, so someone else can come up too, please. So Michael Servetus was martyred in 1553, and another of his followers... Can you hide this one until... Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's going to be a big reveal. Another of Michael Servetus' followers was an Italian lawyer named Laelius Sicinus. He died in 1562. I know that's a little weird. The timeline's off. He left his papers to his nephew Faustus, who organized them and published them and de further developed these ideas. And he became a chief advocate in Europe for Unitarianism. His followers eventually founded a community in Poland, which they were persecuted. They found some refuge in Transylvania. And then those beliefs that Socinus' uh, family became known as Socinians. And they found a lot of support in England and America in the 18th century. So here's a second pop quiz. Why is that important to us here 
where we are Unitarians in the Mid-Atlantic. Richard. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to call on me. <laughs> what is the district, or what was the district formerly known as? Joseph Priestley, why? Because Joseph Priestley was a Socinian. Yes, okay, now we're ready for the, yep. 1774, uh, Joseph Priestley supported the first Unitarian church, in, the first Unitarian service in England, and he became quite radical, and eventually he came to America here, and he gave a series of sermons in Philadelphia, which led to the founding of the First Unitarian Church in Philadelphia. So our roots, our uh, roots all over the globe, this is Europe right now, are radical. They're courageous, they're full of reason and toleration and discovery. So this is who we are. And this is who we continue to be, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. Thank you to our timeline.